Hello and welcome. My name is Londa Carter and this is season one, episode 15 of Hey Hun, You Woke Up. This podcast is brought to you on 10 different platforms, including Stitcher, iTunes, and Anchor. And just so that you know, episode 14, it was too long, too big of a file to upload, so it's available on YouTube so you can check it out there. Today, Hannah and I talk about a specific wine MLM that's called Scout and Sellers. Now, Hannah has been in the wine industry for 20 years. She's been in sales and marketing. And if you don't know, my husband is also in the wine industry. So I know a little bit, nothing like what my husband knows or what Hannah knows or anything like that. But because of my background with what my husband does, for some reason, it's just the wine MLMs are some that just really get under my skin. Now, our connection was a little bit shaky today. So, you know, be forgiving on that for some reason. And I think you guys know what's going on in the world. Everybody is on like the internet and using various different meeting software. So things are just a little bit wonky. So just please keep that in mind. And now join me as Hannah and I have a little chit chat. Hannah, thank you so much for joining me today. I really, I, I can't even talk. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. I know the world is absolutely crazy right now. And for some reason, I guess I just had this maybe dream that since everything is so bizarre, and there's so many people who are out of work that just maybe multi-level marketing companies would not have their distributors going out and trying to latch onto new people. Unfortunately, um, I was very wrong in that. Very, very wrong. And I know you reached out to me because of something, because you've been monitoring it in the um, MLM wine world. And I think particularly you have been looking at Scott and Sellers um, and your background is in wine and all of that. So tell me, what are some of the things that you have seen? And then also, why do you think that you're seeing kind of like an uptick in terms of, you know, the Scott and Teller Huns coming after people? Yeah, they're recruiting really heavily right now and kind of using the fact that online wine sales are really up right now. I mean, wine sales in general are, are up, I think, 55, 60% right now. So a lot of people are looking to buy wines online and kind of how I got started with this is I admin some Facebook groups that are sort of for wine enthusiasts. And I started noticing recently, it's just link after link after link, buy wine from me. And mostly it's Scout and Seller that I see doing this recently. And then yesterday I saw a YouTube video that just burned me up. <laughs> so that's why I reached out. Um, just so much misinformation that is being perpetuated out and as someone who spent the last 20 years trying to educate people about wine, it's really tough to see um, just non-facts being put out there when that's my job is to try to educate people about the facts about wine. So um, that's been really tough. But yeah, if you, they are recruiting very heavily right now because online wine sales seem so appealing uh, at this point in time where we are in the world. Well, you know, that does make sense. I mean, I buy a lot of stuff online anyway. That's just what I do. My husband thinks I'm kind of a weirdo about that, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> but, you know, I do. I buy everything just as much as I can online just because it's convenient. And now with most people being, you know, like locked in their homes, so to speak, and, you know, just kind of like really, you can go out and go to the store. There's just so many things you can't do right now. I can understand why... Um, people would start taking advantage of that. And I find it very, very disturbing. Now, what I would like to know about is some of the misinformation that is given, because I will say, having been in an MLM myself and my husband having a background in wine, being a Psalm and all that, I have more knowledge probably than the average bear about wine. I mean, not like, mm -hmm. you know, not like him, not like you, but you know, more than the average bear. Um, right. But what I do know is there's a lot of people out there that have very little knowledge and are going to be absolutely clueless. And this might look like this is a great thing to do because it's just going to show up on my doorstep. Unfortunately, they're probably going to have to keep volume of some sort. I haven't looked at um, Scott and Seller's um, 
or scout and sellers compensation plan, or maybe if I did, I don't remember because I've looked at so many, but I think that it might be hard for people to keep that up for very long. I don't know. I mean, maybe, you know, if there is some kind of special going on right now so they can get more people into the system. Well, I, I see them innovating with products right now, but I think the most important aspect of volume is that as a customer, depending on which state you live in, um, MLMs are regulated by the FTC like any other MLM company, but they're also regulated by the TTB, which is the Trade and Tax Bureau that puts in place restrictions based on what state you live on in and how much wine you can have shipped to your household. Um, so that comes into play a lot. Like I live in Tennessee, and the restriction here is that you may only order online from one supplier up to a case per month or in total three cases per year. So um, I know that the CEO of Scout and Seller, she was a lawyer, that's what her job was. She, she worked in the wine industry in compliance, like not on the wine making side, which it should be noted, these wine MLM companies are not wineries and that I can go into that a little bit later, but they are not wineries, they are sourcing product, um, they're not property owners or making wines themselves, they, they're just a go-between. Um, but but I think her background is in compliance, but it scares me that they're not being compliant. Um, it's a felony in my state if you violate those, those shipping laws. And in February, they announced like a federal initiative to crack down on those shipping laws, which I'm sure is not a priority right this second because there's so much else going on right now. Um, but eventually they are going to um, start investigating you know, people who are violating that law. And I can't imagine that as a representative of a wine MLM company, you wouldn't want to be purchasing product either for your own consumption or to share with others in order to sell to them. That would put you over that limit. Yeah, I would think that it, that it would, especially if you are, you know, getting the wine and then going off and having these little parties because you always have to like replenish or stock. You don't have, yeah. you know, endless supply of it. Um, well, which, and I will say, I, I listened to your first interview. Was it Heather? Yeah. yeah. Okay, your friend Heather. And you guys had talked about the rodeo and having the event at the rodeo. And I actually looked up the Texas guidelines and six cases would have actually exceeded the legal limit for one purchase within the state of Texas. So they would have had to have multiple people buy multiple cases and bring it together and would kind of be skirting the law in that way um, in order to buy six cases at one time. Well, that's, the, I mean, okay, doing that kind of stuff, that's really, if that's the case, and you're, yes, I believe what you're saying, but I'm trying to like put it in perspective for myself, like um, with Beachbody, because I just go back to that because that's what I know. Um, people would have other people sign up underneath them, but run the account. So it looks like they have a team. So I'm presuming that these huns would do the same thing. Like their husband is buying a case. Now their sister is buying a case. Their mother is buying. So then they can get it all for whatever. Does that make sense? Right. People go about it in different ways. And since she is an expert in compliance, I'm sure that they are getting around the state laws in some way or another. And some states don't, I mean, they have very lax laws. Uh, where you can order as much as you want, really. But, I mean, for the most part, most states are somewhere in between. You can't order any at all, and you can order as much as you want. And it can get really, really complicated. So um, if someone from Scout & Seller is listening to this, like, absolutely, you need to go investigate what your state's laws are. Uh, because I went through the Scout & Seller website and put in a purchase that would have been, you know, in violation of my state's laws and it never said at any point in time that they were not going to fulfill that order or anything like all the way up to you know click the button it, it there was a little asterisk at the bottom that said you know if we cannot ship you these wines it was more like gearing towards if these wines are out of stock we will refund your credit card <laughs> but for the most part there was no point in time where it, it indicated at all that I was doing something illegal by purchasing that product. 
That's interesting and scary. So that would make me think yes. that if you're a distributor for them, you're, you're going to have no idea what the, the laws are for your state or any other state where you might be having you know, someone in Louisiana or Florida, wherever, somewhere that you don't live and mm -hmm. they're buying from you. You're, you're not going to even think about that, but you could be encouraging people to break the law by purchasing wine through you mm -hmm. unknowingly. Is that right? Yes. And I didn't even really think of this until I had a phone conversation with someone from Scout and Seller who reached out to me. She indicated that she was very high up within the company. And so I asked her this question, like what, how, how did they go about educating about DTC shipping laws? And she could not answer that question, which was scary to me because as someone who's influential within that organization, you would think that she would be at least knowledgeable about it, about her own state. But she couldn't answer any of the questions that I, that I asked her pretty much anything. So that's very scary. But to me, that goes back to any of the training through these MLMs. It's not comprehensive and it's typically about just their product only nothing around it to teach you anything else other than sell this, sell this, sell this. And that's probably, I'm guessing what they have as well. And it's, it sounds yeah, like that sure they're teetering. Program, yeah, I'm not sure what their education program looks like. Um, it, it seems to me, because I see the same consistent rhetoric over and over and over, seems very full of holes because I just, you know, as someone who is in the industry, I'm able to ask questions that are um, targeted and I have not once ever got an answer that was correct. Uh, so I, I mean, I, I have to admit, I don't blame the women or men who are working for this company because they are just re repeating what they're given. Like they, they don't know what they don't know. And so they don't really have a foundation of knowledge to be able to process the information that they're being given. Um, and I don't blame them for that, but I do, I do blame the top. Like I mean, she herself with the whole level three song thing, like I, I just can't even get past that because it's so misleading. Like if that's what they're leading with, you can pretty much know that every, anything after that is going to be full of holes. Now, people who are listening are probably not going to know what you mean by her using level three psalm and that how that's incorrect. So can you explain that for the audience? Yes, I would be glad to. Um, so. Technically, the phrase level three psalm, like there's no such thing that doesn't exist. There are only two ways that you can call yourself a sommelier. And the first is if you work in a restaurant as a sommelier. Like I think you said your husband is a sommelier. Um, so technically it requires no certification whatsoever. I could become a sommelier overnight if I applied at a restaurant for that job and was hired. Um, that's the first way. The second way is if you've passed any of the levels of examination through the Court of Master Sommeliers, which is a certifying body that is really highly regarded. Like, I mean, it's really focused on that sommelier role within a restaurant. So it's not just wine knowledge, it's service, it's cocktails, cigars. I mean, very, very involved. If you've ever seen the documentary series Psalm, like, and a lot of people have seen that, uh, documentary. It's really entertaining. I would encourage anyone to, to go and watch it, especially if you have some downtime right now, but you can see that it's very involved. But there are no levels of the Court of Master Sommelier. If you pass the first examination, you're awarded the title Introductory Sommelier. And you can take that with you the rest of your life, right? I mean, you put it on your business card or your email signature. It's just like having an MD. Like, you're an Introductory Sommelier. The next level is certified sommelier, and then the next level is advanced sommelier. So technically, the third stage of the Court of Master Sommelier's exam is advanced sommelier. Um, and then, of course, there's master sommelier, which is just like the top 0.0001%. I think there are 14 women have passed the master sommelier exam since the beginning of that exam in the 80s. I think so we very just difficult. Now, we what just, she is, is WSET certified, which is just... Oh, I, I was going to say, oh, um, no. here in Houston, I think we just got a couple of more master psalms because I know Guy Stout, he's at Specs, and I can't, I can't think of the other ones, but we have, I think, eight in Houston, eight masters, which is, you know, a pretty high yeah, number considering there's not that many. 
Right, right. I think there, there are maybe like a hundred ish now that are living, um, working in the United States. So, I mean, even the advanced sommelier test, like a record number of people passed the advanced last year and that number was 23. Like 23 people passed the advanced in the year 2019 and that's in North America. Like only 23 people passed. So it's very difficult, very involved. Yeah, yeah, it's it. And it when is. she says level three psalm, yeah, when she says level three psalm, she's implying that she's an advanced sommelier because, and, and, and she's not. I, mean, I know she's not because she would say advanced sommelier if she had gone through the court of master sommelier's exams. Right. WSAT and the court are two different, two different entities. Yeah, there's no sommelier affiliation with WSET. It's just a different certifying body. Equally, I mean, it, it's, it, I sh I'm not going to discredit it. It's hard. Um, it's very respected organization. It's just apples to oranges. Yeah. Like, there's no psalm component to WSET. Yeah, yeah. No, totally get that. Okay, I'm very curious about some of the rhetoric and stuff that you're seeing right now. What are some of the things, I guess they're buzz phrases, what are they saying that just kind of makes your spidey sense go like, ah, oh, this is so totally off? <laughs> well, the biggest one is the phrase clean crafted, uh, which is a trademarked term that they came up with uh, for marketing purposes that describes Describe something that already exists and has existed for decades within the wine industry called natural wines. So they're kind of sitting here and, and pushing forward this clean crafted movement and saying that they are the first to market with clean crafted, which is technically correct because they came up with that term, but they're definitely not the first to market natural wines. That started in California probably in the late 60s, early 70s. And um, in actuality, they're sourcing product. They're having the wineries that pioneered natural wines in the United States make the wines for them that they're selling them for double, triple the price. Yeah, um, I can imagine. Like, can you mention any of the wineries that you think are making their wines for them? Oh, I I know. Like uh, the first four or five wines that I clicked on, on their website, just from information that's on their own description within <laughs> on their website, I immediately knew what wineries were making that wine, probably bottling that wine for them. They're just slapping a different label on it. Um, the first, I don't want to name any names because. I think anybody who's listening who is in the wine industry will, will be able to figure it out themselves. But um, the first one I clicked on was Gallivant Chardonnay. And in it, it says, you know, source from a winery in Monterey that was planted with Chardonnay in 1883. And anyone who works in the wine industry will know what winery that is because there is only one. And it's very famous. It's a huge producer. Um, they... Their clone of Chardonnay is very famous. Like if you're listening to this and you know anything about wine, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about because their clone is famous. 90% of the Chardonnay that's planted in the United States comes from their clone of Chardonnay. So um, I think it's it's just it's a little bit misleading because they they like to indicate that their wines are coming from these sources that are small producers. Um, actually, they like to pretend like they are a winery themselves when they are not. They're just sourcing product from existing wineries that have existing brands. And this particular one got me because I'm very familiar with this brand and I buy it all the time. I can go down to the grocery store and buy their Monterey Chardonnay for $13.99, whereas theirs is $25 plus shipping plus whatever. Like, and $13.99, I'm paying for the three to your distribution system I'm, I'm even paying for the middleman there um and so it just it makes me curious because they're definitely standing on some moral high ground uh, i'm going to steal this from someone else in the wine industry but um if you can visualize somebody standing on a, on a hill waving this moral superiority flag saying our wines are better because of x y and z when they're just sourcing product from wineries that already make wine and are available at your grocery store. Wow. 
And so people can get it for a lot less just by going to HEB, going to Kroger, going to whatever grocery store is around them and bam. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is dirty. Now, okay, I have to ask this because this does give me a huge <laughs> concern. If there are there, and you're saying, I'm not, I keep mm -hmm. saying if, because I'm trying to do the alleged thing, you know, like I don't want to be pointing fingers at anyone. But right. with such huge producers doing this, it makes me very concerned that they're willing to do that for a multi-level marketing company. It makes me think they don't know the damage that those companies create out in the world. And that, you know, it's like, but they're willing to do it for, you know, like, okay, yeah, you're going to pay me. So yeah, I'm going to do it, which I wish they would be like, you know what, because you're multi-level marketing, I'm not going to do it for you. Well, um, Sourcing is actually really common though. And I'm, I'm not certain that they are even aware of who is buying their product. Um, let me just, let me explain sourcing really quick. Um, because I mentioned earlier that an MLM, actually MLMs, wine clubs, any sort of online curation service that you might see advertised, those are not for the most part, those are not wineries. Like they are not, property owners, they may not even have any involvement in the actual making of the wine. In fact, um, I have received a message back from Scout and Sellers Customer Service. Uh, they do buy bulk grapes, but they also buy fully finished bottled product most of the time. Um, so these large producers, they benefit from selling off extra juice that they may not, you know, they may have a second, third press of their harvest that they don't want to put in the bottle underneath their own name. Um, they make their wine with their best fruit and then it serves them well to sell off whatever is left or put it in bottle and sell it off to a third party company. And that's really common. I mean, it happens a lot. Um, any, grocery store private label that you have that you see in the grocery store um similar you know it's just a third party company and they're contracting either short or long term with these wineries to get their third press juice put in a bottle so they can sell it at their store gotcha gotcha so wow so well with it being third press and everything then that it's not going to be as um I guess the finish on it, it's not going to be as good of a wine as it would if it's like their first press. Would that be right? Yeah, the quality probably is not as good as what they put in bottle under their own name, but it still may reach those standards that they require for clean crafted, which is the, you know, because really what is in the bottle has very little to do with the wine making, more to do with what goes on in the vineyard during the grape growing season. Um, so in, you know, the wineries that are in charge of the vineyards, they're the ones that are going to control the quality will end up in the bottle. Um, and I should preface this by saying most of what I'm talking about today um, are the non-mass produced wines because I would be an idiot if I did not mention that there are lots of wines that are mass produced that probably have additives or, you know, something to make sure that it's consistent, shelf stable, and at a certain price all the time because there are a lot of consumers out there that that's all they want. So we're going to not talk about those. I'm talking about the family owned wineries that could be small producers or could be very large producers like in this case um, because they have better control of what's going on in the vineyard. Gotcha. Gotcha. Wow. Um, so what are some of the things that the, um, distributors, the scout and seller distributors are saying like in their posts that you see in the groups that you admin? Oh gosh. Well, I think probably the biggest lie that they're selling. And again, I do not blame the reps because they don't understand this. They're just repeating what they're being told. But I think the biggest lie that they're selling is that there are either, it's very black and white. There are either wines that are full of toxins and poisonous to you, or there are wines that are clean, right? Which for the most part, it always lies somewhere in between those. Um, even the most certified biodynamic 
uh, vineyard and, and winery in the United States has found Roundup, like glyphosate, in their vineyards just due to rain because it's everywhere, right? It's, it's in the cloud, it gets evaporated up into the clouds and then it rains and it gets in the vineyard somehow. So I know that they say that they're double lab tested, which I have to kind of laugh at because any winery worth their salt is doing multiple tests all throughout the wine making process. Like that is really an arbitrary term. And they say they're transparent, but they're not. Like I inquired about what labs are doing their testing and they said they don't reveal this to, uh, they just don't reveal it, which I think is funny because I've seen lots of reps say, oh, we're so transparent about what's in our wines. When in actuality, I've never seen um, any sort of nutrition labeling or ingredient labeling, which could be done. Like there are wineries that do that. Even though it's not required, there are wineries that put nutrition labels on their wines because they want, they just want to be very transparent. So I would question why they're not doing that if they're so adamant that their wines are clean crafted. Um, but yeah, I see lots of things. I mean, let's see. They, I mean, I've seen the statement that they're changing the world with their wines, which again, moral superiority flag here, you know, I mean, you can say that your wines are worth more because you say they're worth more because they're clean crafted, but um, like I've mentioned before, they're just sourcing. So um, I find that really irritating. And also, this is probably something I should say very far away from, um, but they make a lot of health claims. And as someone who, I, I deal with an autoimmune disorder, um, something called a DAO, DAO deficiency, and it's taken me about 10 years to finally get a diagnosis because I react to wine myself. So this is just my personal experience, but I get hives, I get headaches, and it's not because of sulfites, and it usually never is. Um, sulfite allergies are very rare, um, but for me, it's the histamines in wine. So. You know, I see this information pushed out all the time, like, oh, our wines don't have sulfites, they're not going to give you a headache, when in actuality, there could be a million different reasons why you're reacting to wine. And I definitely wouldn't be taking medical advice from a wine professional or someone who claims to be a wine professional. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I totally do. And it's interesting that they use the phrase that their wines are changing the world because when you start, and I, I did one video where I looked at the language and I was looking at just like health and wellness MLMs and a lot mm -hmm. of the same language, they keep using the similar type words and it sounds like they're doing the same thing. And usually always the message is that their product is somehow making the planet better, that they are somehow just you know, their company is so amazing that it's making such a difference in the difference in the world. Which so I'm not surprised because that is very, very much in the uh, I guess the DNA of multi-level marketing, if you will. Now I am interested on this whole concept of quote clean yeah, crafted that they keep saying that they're clean crafted. So what does that <laughs> really mean and what is the real language for it? Because you mentioned earlier that they basically made up this arbitrary language for it to be um, stand out, so to speak. Right. So natural wines, like there's not a real definition for that. It's more of an ideology. Um, so it's, it's the idea that from vineyard all the way through to the bottling, you're manipulating the wine as little as possible. Like you're trying not to have any human intervention. So you're not using pesticides. You're not irrigating if you don't have to. Um, you're not having. You're not putting any additives in during the wine during the vinification process. Uh, which I have to say, going back to sulfites, like sulfites is something that's naturally occurring. It's there to preserve the wine and make sure that bacteria doesn't start growing in the bottle. So any wine that has very little sulfites in it, the shelf life is going to be very short. Um, and actually they started doing this. I, I was doing some research. They started adding sulfites to wines in the eighth century BC. So it's, it's not like an unnatural process. It's, it's something that preserves the wine and prevents bacteria from growing inside the bottle. Um, but yeah, natural wines, it's becoming more popular because I think we're just living in a world where people are wanting 
more organic, you know, they're just more aware of what they're putting in their body. And so many family owned wineries in some form or fashion, you know, follow these techniques simply because they own their land and spraying it down with Roundup every year is going to not be beneficial for them long term. Um, so many family owned wineries are using these, I mean, they're doing this all the time. Yeah, that makes sense. So what mm -hmm. else can you tell me about, um, like, do you know anybody personally? Because I mean, my friend Heather, you know, she knows people that she works with alongside here in Houston that, you know, they sell wine. That's their, their job, like legitimate wine. But then they also joined an MLM. Have you run into that yourself? I am not. Um, I do know, uh, I'm just acquainted with a few people in my area. I mean, it's, I don't, I don't know how many people, I don't know if it's sat oversaturated here in East Tennessee, um, but I do know of some people, and I, I have to admit, like most of the people that I've talked to who work for Scout and Seller only do it because I guess they feel that's their only reason that, you know, to have friends over and socialize, and I can't blame them for that. I support that. <laughs> like, I do, I do that myself. I spend money on wine and have friends over and you know, prepare food and charcuterie boards and things like that. I, I love to do that too. So, you know, I think there probably are many women and men who get started with Scout and Cellar because it's an easy way to have a reason to, to socialize and entertain. Um, but I don't think that they're educated about, um, you know, sort of the damage that they're doing by, again, misspeaking about a lot of the things about their wine that are being told to them and they're just repeating. Yeah, absolutely. And they're probably told that it's like it's an easy sell because that's usually what you're told. Now, my husband, you know, back when he was a stay-at-home dad before he was married to me, he did do traveling vineyards. Myself, I did go to a traveling vineyards party and I bought one bottle of a Sauvignon Blanc that, I mean, with what I paid for it after the shipping and everything, I'm like, okay, well, I'm really, this is like a $7 bottle of wine. You know, it's really what it's worth but it costs like 30 bucks to get that one bottle. I mean, it was just insane. And so, um, but I do know people go into this thinking somehow just through friends, they're going to be able to get them to buy it. And, you know, they're just going to keep, keep buying it month after month after month. And I think they would get a, a point where people where they're like, you know, it's, because it's going to be more costly to do whatever it is through Scout and Sellers than it is to just go and buy wine yourself. And so oh, absolutely. And, well, I was going to say, seriously, if, if you find a wine that you like and you ask the question, where is this wine sourced from? You know, what winery is making this wine for you? And you don't get an answer. It's really easy to do a quick Google and especially for domestic wines. Imports are a little bit more difficult because it's just so complicated in, in Europe right now um, with all of the laws and co-ops and, you know, people that make wine in Spain and France and Italy. Um, but domestically, it's, it's pretty easy to figure out exactly where that wine came from and buy something similar that's going to be a third of the price when all is said and done. Hey, you know, I just thought of something because right now, um, isn't the state of California on lockdown? I, I think so. I think, I think so. I, I think Pennsylvania is the only state right now that has closed because their uh, liquor stores are government run. They're like ABC stores. Yeah. I yeah. think they're the only one that have actually closed down wine shops. Um, but I'm not, I'm not hundred percent certain right now. Well, I know the vineyards, I mean, they had to like shut down and I mean, I know like in terms of like, you know, shipping things you can't ship things out of california right now so if all of these companies uh, are using you know vineyards and produ producers there how are they going to be able to send wine to people unless they have it from like you know oregon or you know washington or also or new jersey because there's some like wineries up in you know like the east as well but right now that i would don't think it would be a good idea to get anything from that area of you know, the country either yeah, I'm not sure. I think in California, the way I understand it, I could be wrong, but I think the tasting rooms and like the actual wineries themselves are closed. But a lot of my favorite wineries, I've seen them doing specials right now with shipping um, because of what's going on. So 
I always say like it is so much better to go directly to a winery, a brick and mortar winery that you've been to, that you know you like those wines and purchase directly from the winery. That's benefiting them on the ground level. So um, that's always what I recommend to people when they're looking to purchase wine online, as long as it is in compliance with your state laws, of course. Um, but yeah, I mean, for the most part right now, the best thing you could probably do is support your local retailers, like your small business owners that are, um, they're doing the, the, the hard work right now because it's, it, I mean, in my state, they're the only ones that are open still. They're considered essential. And so they're doing a lot of people a lot of good right now, delivering and going out of their way to, you know, service their customers right now. Well, to piggyback on that, I would say also look locally at restaurants who have like a, a nice wine list, like, you know, where my husband works, they're selling some of their bulk wines and stuff. Um, and because you want to support them, supporting our local restaurants, I think is so vital right now because so many people in the service industry, Absolutely. you know, they're, they're not working. And, you know, the way that they can have a place to return to is if we support them in some way. So if you have the means, by all means, get some wine from these places. Do what you can to help them keep the doors open. Yeah, and I've seen some really good prices on some wines being offered by some restaurants right now. We, you know, just do curbside pickup, or they may be, you know, selling off the inventory that they currently have in order to be able to try to stay afloat. So, yeah, I definitely recommend that over anything. I mean, when you're buying wine online, you are kind of risking sometimes that it shows up at your door busted, or yeah. you know, you just never know. I, I always say support your local small business centers if you can. Yeah, it's all if you can right now. But there are people that can. I mean, I know um, where my husband works, you know, they've been selling, I think, one day. Uh, I think they sold like $6,000 worth of wine or something. I mean, it was like a... Good know, for them. I know. I know. Yeah, it's like, that's great. Mm -hmm. that, that, that can really help some places. Now, not all restaurants are going to have a, an enormous wine list, but there are plenty that do, you know, like the, the upper tier type restaurants. They're the ones that are going to have those things. And there are people that still have money coming in, so to speak. And if you can afford mm -hmm. it, you know, it's a, it, cause you are going to be able to get wine that you wouldn't be able to get for at that price. Cause typically you're going to have a Psalm serve it to you. That's going to give you the whole backstory and they're going to get the whole service experience. You're not going to get that experience now, but you can get an excellent bottle of wine that has been, been chosen by, you know, a wine director for a particular restaurant. And so get it if you can. Yeah, I think that's a good segue to going back to that whole, like, it's either black or white. Like, you know, there are many well-made wines that don't have additives or any of these, like, things that are just, um, I feel like the Scout and Cellar representatives just make it seem like it's poison that you're drinking in a bottle but you're not drinking one of their wines and that's just false like there are a lot of really great wines out there that are not going to cause you to react that don't have all those things in them you know and that you can buy at a decent price and it's all perception you know and knowledge like i want everyone to kind of leave this conversation either being more educated or knowing how to go about finding out more information information so that they feel confident uh, with what they're purchasing. Well, I think a great way for them to learn, especially like right now is even like going to wine folly. But if you're going to like call up one of the restaurants that do have wine, ask them questions because there's going to be somebody there who is a professional in wine that can give you real answers. And it's not somebody that's just reading and, you know, the notes for a particular bottle of wine. They actually know it. They can talk about wine like all day long. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Where else would you recommend right now for people if they did want to get educated in wine? Where would you say, like, if, if you wanted to go online and learn about something, would you say go to some of the vineyard websites and, you know, contact them? What are, what are some things that you would say? Well, if you've got a little bit of extra time on your hands and you just want, like, a good basic 
introduction to wine, uh, there are a few websites I would recommend. One is that WSET, Wine Spirits Education Trust, which I think is WSET.org. Um, you know, they have lots of like online learning modules or, you know, a lot of information. Another one is SWE, which is the Society of Wine Educators website. Um, they have a lot of, uh, actually, they have videos and sort of like some little seminars that you can take and just a lot of good information if you want like to do some extra reading, uh, maybe you have some downtime. Um, those are both great resources. Excellent. Well, I want to say thank you so much. And I'm going to like, we can, you know, end this now and then you and I will can do our own little like chitty chat. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much Cheers. for your time. <laughs> Cheers. No problem. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Hannah, so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And you know, what I really feel is that people don't know what they don't know. And when someone is joining any MLM, specifically in this case a wine MLM, they have no idea that, you know, they're not really getting as much information, good information that can be helpful to others. And so often when you're in an MLM, and I'm speaking from my own experience because yes, I'm a former Beachbody hun, you think you know more than what you do because you think the people in the company are these experts and they're giving you absolutely the best information. And I'm pretty sure that any wine MLM is going to package up their tasting notes and make any training type things available to seem all really super legit. And I'm not saying that the information is not legit. They're just not being told the full story. And honestly, in my opinion, that's what all MLMs do, no matter what product or service they shill. If we want there to be change in the world, remember it's up to us to speak out and change starts now.